Uh, hey everybody, how you doing? Yeah, this is uh, this is Dan Wagner. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in just a moment. But the the webcast today, the topic we're going to be going through, creating technical documentation with SolidWorks Composer. And this is a topic. This is a, a tool I've spent quite a quite a bit of time with. I've taught the class for it quite a lot and helped companies implement it. And uh, I've I've uh, you know really seen a lot of tech support cases with it as well. So I've seen kind of all all ends of the spectrum with Composer, and I really enjoy working with it. And I, and I, I enjoy this presentation because it's a entry level um, introductory presentation to using SolidWorks Composer. And uh, I always enjoy it because I think in a lot of cases, this is new content for people. And uh, with SolidWorks stuff, I think, you know, we, we've all seen SolidWorks and and that's why uh, Composer can be so exciting because a lot a lot of times it's it's uh, very new. So just really quick, a little bit more about me. I've been in the industry since 2008. So this summer will be 12 years for me. Got some pictures there, me and my wife, and then we have a crazy son named Leon. And I included this just because this, this is a really accurate representation of my quarantine life at the moment with a four-year-old in a really small house. So uh, there's the potential he could blow down the basement door and, and interrupt my webcast at any moment. But I've asked my wife to restrain him for at least the next hour and uh, 90 minutes and, and or 90 minutes. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that works out. So we'll see. Uh, I'd love brewing beer on the side. One of my favorite hobbies. Uh, I went to Temple University here in Philadelphia. And uh, yeah, I've, I've worked all all sides of the spectrum from from the really the tech end or what we call the application engineer end of of uh, the reseller industry from doing tech support to doing sales demonstrations to doing training. Uh, really, I've, I've dabbled in all of it. And as Chris mentioned, currently I manage the tech support team at CATI. So there's actually uh, a handful of managers here and, and we manage quite a quite a large team of technical support people. Uh, that will be there to answer questions if you give us a call or send an email into the team. And that certainly includes Composer as well. So we're here today to talk about Composer. And chances are, if, if you were to use Composer and submit a question to us at the moment, uh, it would probably go to me. I handle still quite a large amount of Composer cases myself, and we're growing that knowledge base still, and new new team members are are, are becoming familiar with it. but. I still really love being on the front lines with it. So if, if you do end up having a question or use the software, um, you know, in industry and you want to give us a call, we might get a chance to speak then as well. So this presentation, um, I kind of mentioned I've done before, and I actually created it initially to, to present at SolidWorks World and have done so uh, twice now. And this is as advertised. This is kind of a really wordy slide, a little too many, too many words on one slide here, but. Um, just as as it was advertised, here's the expectations and here's what I'm hoping to do and hoping to accomplish with this beginner session. It's an in-depth overview of creating technical documentation using SolidWorks Composer. And SolidWorks loves if we statements. So if we can start that technical documentation much earlier in our product uh, life cycle, we can get our products to market faster. So the idea with Composer, again, is is you're able to begin these technical documentations, begin these things much earlier in the design process and not have to wait until the very end. And then it goes on to say SolidWorks Composer uh, allows SolidWorks users and non-SolidWorks users to leverage existing CAD data to publish images, create animations, uh, all of which for use in technical uh, publications. And that statement I, I included because it helps um, it really helps remind me really of what I love about Composer is it's not just SolidWorks users. It's not just engineers when teaching this class and when helping people get started with Composer. A lot of times it's, it's uh, you know, maybe even a salesperson or a tech publications person, um, a marketing person. I've had owners of companies uh, take the Composer class as well. And that's another thing I really love about Composer is it, it and, and working with engineers is great, but Composer gets us to work with all these other groups of people as well. So what's our agenda here? First, I wanna cover what is technical, uh, technical documentation, how do we define that, and what is it with or without Composer? And then we're gonna actually walk through the process, get right into importing SOLIDWORKS files in Composer, creating some technical documentation, which in really, in most cases, falls in just one of three buckets, images, animations, or interactive content. And then uh, 
what do you do if something changes? What do you do if you've made that content and then something changes down the road? We want to talk about updating those composer files with changes. And then we'll wrap up with just some general composer tips and tricks and things we've kind of uh, kind of picked up along the way. And a lot of this comes from tech support. It comes from fielding technical cases. You know, teaching the class is one thing. Teaching composer out of a book, out of a pre-cooked set of files is one thing. And that goes for really any product. But you really learn a product when you do tech support for it and you get questions, you get quirks, you get you know how to uh, questions that come in after the fact. And I'm, I, I've really started to see this curve over the last couple of years where customers are calling in that know more than I do. You know, then you reach that point, and I think uh, with SolidWorks, we probably reached that point years ago. So the, the SolidWorks users are so strong and have been using the product day in, day out for so long that they're so highly skilled. In a lot of cases, they're they're going to know more than than you do, at least again about their specific field. And Composer is kind of reaching that critical mass too, is to get these people that that call into support with really cool Composer files, really complex Composer files that usually end up teaching me a thing or two along the way as well. So, and again, that's where the, the kind of tips and tricks uh, comes from. So, what's the data set? What are we using today? Uh, it's always nice to use like a cool data set or something unique. This is a drone that many, many years ago, uh, we actually printed and completed and built this drone for a what's new data set. And uh, if, if you've been following me, at least over, over the years, I've actually worked for Prism Engineering, which was acquired by Fisher Unitech, which was acquired now by CATI. And this was a Prism Engineering data set. So it's still in the family. It's still all the same technical people that helped kind of create this. But this was a, a legitimate, 3D printed flying quadcopter, and it was it was a really fun data set. This was a really bad idea, flying this thing in my office in in our office here near near Philadelphia. Very very terrible, dangerous idea. I don't know why I did this, but right towards the end here, uh, I did actually end up crashing it, and I don't think it's flown since. I do have it here, <laughs> so uh, I don't think it's flown since though. So the cool thing about this though is you can actually go to Thingiverse.com and still download this. So this is still a publicly available data set. You can download and build your own drone and, and kind of walk through that process. It's really fun. It was definitely um, definitely a fun uh, pro uh, project and it gave us some really great data sets to use in the future. So let's get right into it. What is technical documentation? How do we define that in, in the context of, you know, whether it's created with or without uh, SolidWorks Composer? So normally it's something like uh, instruction manuals, service manuals, exploded views, animations, uh, website uh, or marketing materials. Uh, you can feel free to throw an idea in the chat if, if technical documentation means something else to you. If when you ship your products at your company, is there some tech pub that has to be with it? you know, a, a, a breakdown of certain parts or, or a certain standard or something like that. And again, these are all things that I usually end up learning when someone calls into support and we find that out. Um, I find that out after the fact. But for the purposes of this presentation, these are kind of just some generic buckets that we would say technical documentation uh, falls into. So what is it like to create without Composer? How do you create tech, doc, tech docs without Composer? And normally you would see digital pictures, uh, screenshots from CAD, you know, screenshots from SolidWorks, which look awesome. SolidWorks looks really nice and, and gives you really realistic views, but there's some downsides to that. Those things can't be updated if something changes. You know, if I make, if I take a screenshot of this drone and then I make a service manual for it and we even just make PDFs or even get all the way to printing, and then if something happens with this drone, something changes in the design, I actually have to go back and redo those screenshots. I go back to SolidWorks, redo the screenshots and re-export them into, you know, whatever my, my uh, end tool is, whatever my end documentation tool is. So that's difficult because it definitely uh, can end up costing you a lot of time and money. And this also means this isn't concurrent because with Composer, you can model your part in SolidWorks and uh, you know maybe get the first revision done or the first design idea done. And then concurrently, the documentation can begin. The technical documentation can begin. 
because this can be pulled into Composer right away. And you can start creating images, start creating whatever you need to. And if something changes, that can be updated in Composer. So this is what it looks like without Composer. What does it look like with Composer? Content with Comp uh, in Composer is built in a purpose-built tool. So things like putting arrows on faces and call-outs and really complex and um, you know neat views and cutaways, they're purpose built, composers purpose built to do those things. And, you know, maybe doing this arrow, for example, in SolidWorks would be kind of painful. You'd actually have to model that or bring that in as some kind of uh, external entity to show some kind of image like that, or use this in a, you know, a separate tool, maybe bring this into Photoshop or, or something like that. Again, the content can be updated. So if, if I know my assembly were to change, if I know my CAD file were to change, we can update our composer files with that. And the fact is, if, if you're creating it uh, with composer, it doesn't have to be a SolidWorks user. It certainly can be a non SolidWorks user. And in a lot of cases, I think that ends up being, uh, um, it, it ends up being much more complex or, or creative content because you have these marketing people or, um, you know, maybe graphic artists that really get to put their their graphical spin on these composer files, which is really cool to see. Okay, so we're going to do this live, create a composer file live and import this into SolidWorks Composer. And there's two different ways. I have two different slides here. We can either import into composer um, with just choosing composer's import profile, or I'm just going to jump to the slide and we'll roll back here in a second. Or you can also save as from SolidWorks. We can talk about doing it both ways. I'm going to revert back to just this way to start with, but I think we'll you'll, you'll see the benefits and and um, you know and and kind of see it both ways here in just a second. But just kind of wanted to highlight that. So let's jump out to Composer, and in Composer, I'm just going to do File Open because that's what you do. You open CAD data in Composer, and if I want to browse and open up a, a SolidWorks assembly or or you know some CAD assembly. I have it set right now just to all uh, all authorized 3D files. And I'm gonna choose my drone main assembly, this top level main assembly, and uh, choose that to start with. But again, you can import really any 3D CAD file and you see this list, it's very uh, similar to the list you might see inside of SolidWorks in terms of importing CAD data. So the, the data or the top, the uh, assembly we're gonna choose is this top level drone main assembly. And when you choose a SOLIDWORKS assembly, you get some additional options here. So first of all, what's your import profile? And one of the things we're gonna talk about is the uh, options and the entities that come in from SOLIDWORKS. An easy way to control that, an easy way to make sure you're doing this correctly is once you hit file open and you choose your assembly, set your profile here, your import profile to SOLIDWORKS. And notice it'll actually gray out the options and it will just um, use that as the profile for importing this file. This is important for a couple of reasons and I'll, I'll, I'll dig into those once we have the file open, but know that you can also set this by default so it does it for you every time. On file open here, I can also choose to go back to go to the SOLIDWORKS list and choose a specific configuration. So do I wanna bring in one specific configuration of this file? Do I wanna make multiple copies of this file and bring in multiple different configurations? That's the benefit of working with a SOLIDWORKS tool here is it's able to actually dig in and see configuration data in these files. You also can import the SOLIDWORKS bill material, uh, assembly envelope components, exploded views, SOLIDWORKS appearances, a lot of really cool things that you might say, hey, even though I took the time to do those in SOLIDWORKS, especially the bill of material, that's a really powerful one. You can leverage those things here in Composer. All right, so I'm gonna hit uh, open here. And what it'll do is it will actually open that assembly in SOLIDWORKS. It will launch SOLIDWORKS, open that drone main assembly, uh, do the conversion, It'll come in a composer and then SOLIDWORKS will, will close in the background. You don't really even see that happening. It's just kind of happening in the background, but it does actually use the drone, uh, the SOLIDWORKS install to convert the drone to, a, to the uh, composer file here, which is pretty interesting. If you don't have SOLIDWORKS on your machine, 
there's a free importer, a free converter that you install that does the same thing. So you don't need to have SolidWorks on the machine. It's kind of beneficial if you do, but it's definitely not required. You can just use the free uh, free converter here. So this will take just a second. The, the more complex, the larger the file, the longer it's gonna take. And that's just this first conversion. From here, opening and working with the SMG file is actually really fast. And, and you'll see it's actually faster than the SolidWorks file. So we've got the file in. This is our our full 3D assembly from uh, the, the SolidWorks assembly. So before we move any further, let's kind of jump back to the presentation here and uh, and review what we did. So we did file open. We chose SolidWorks assembly to bring that in directly into Composer. And when we chose the assembly, we made sure to choose the SolidWorks import profile. These options are important because it, it controls, again, what comes in. For example, do you want to bring in free faces? Free faces in Composer is the same thing as uh, surface bodies in SolidWorks. So a lot of companies use surface bodies for construction, for reference. Maybe you don't want to bring all that stuff into Composer. So that's, that's an option, and it's definitely an option you want to be aware of. I've also seen it on the other end. A company will call into support and say, hey, I'm opening my assemblies, but none of our vendor data, none of the downloaded data is showing for some reason. In, in most cases, that's because that vendor data, uh, vendor data was surface bodies or surface models, and you need to have this turned on to have those show up in Composer. So there's other things here to be aware of, but honestly, the easy thing to start with, and, and this is really what this webinar, this webcast is all about, just getting started. We did file open, we chose the assembly, and we chose SolidWorks for the import profile. Now, I, I included this slide and I mentioned it before, just to say that you can also save as SMG from SolidWorks. That's an option too. It's not an option for everybody because you might not have SolidWorks on your machine. Um, SolidWorks might not be you know, part of your install. It might be you know, from, it might, it might be in a company again where you're not the SolidWorks user, uh, you're you're the technical writer. You're the composer user, but this is a nice option if you have SolidWorks and Composer on the same machine. SolidWorks can do the same conversion with all the same options directly from SolidWorks. So just know that's an option. If if you have the assembly open to SolidWorks, you could do file save as SMG. Another option there is maybe you you do have a separate SolidWorks user and a tech writer. And maybe the SOLIDWORKS user, if he's a really nice guy, will save you some time and save the SMGs out for you and just drop them in a folder uh, you know, that you can access so you don't have to, um, again, convert them yourself. Um, a lot of options there, but really just kind of showing you both, uh, again, both what, um, what, what both sides of this and what your options are. So we had a great question uh, that, that came in. Where do you find the free translator? Because I'm, I'm mentioning using SOLIDWORKS uh, as the, the main translator, which is what I did here. If you don't have SOLIDWORKS, the translator is actually built into the install. So you don't have to go to download it separately. You don't have to find it separately. In fact, when you install Composer, and if it notices that you don't have SOLIDWORKS installed, it should, by default, install the translator as well. Um, if it doesn't, you can certainly call into support. And if it doesn't, you'll know pretty quickly because it will fail to convert anything into a composer file for you. But it's an easy fix. We can help you in support if, if that were to, to come up. Okay, so we, um, again, saved as SMG. That's the composer file type, SMG. There is some other ones. When you, when you take the class, we dig into some of the other options. But if you're getting started with composer, we're just beginning our composer process here .smg is the very first file type you want to look at. All of the property, geometry, view, and animation information is contained in a single file. So when I jump back here to Composer, if I want to make sure that I have this saved in the right spot, because when you do file open, I choose that assembly, it actually makes the SMG just in the root folder of your assembly, wherever the assembly was. So maybe you want to specifically say, I'm going to save this as SOLIDWORKS Composer, and I'm in that CAD data folder. I'm in that same folder where the SOLIDWORKS file was. I'll make a new folder in there for today. We'll call it Composer. And in that Composer folder, which should be an empty folder at this point, I'm saving this .smg. And I'll just kind of briefly drop this down just so you can see there are, in fact, other options here. There's definitely other things you can publish out of Composer. 
Um, specifically in the class, we get into the SMG XML and the SMG project files, some of the benefits of using those. But this is a reminder uh, for, for someone getting started learning Composer, you really just want to stick with .smg out of the box. So that's what we're sticking with, .smg. It's going to save this drone main assembly SMG right in that same folder. Okay. So that feels, right? that feels like we did a lot so far, but actually really all we did was open the, the data in Composer, open, open the, the CAD data in Composer, and then saved as SMG. And that'll happen pretty quickly. And once you once you kind of get used to that process, that's that's pretty easy. So now that we have that file, we have that SMG to work with, you can kind of think about um, the fact that it, it has now diverged from the CAD data. The CAD data can continue being uh, revisioned and worked on and developed. The CAD data is is still continuing down its path. Now we have our own SMG file that we can work with and start creating some data, start creating some content. And one of the things we'll get to later on is we can certainly update that if anything were to change. So let's really dig into this. What are the three buckets that we say tech illustrations or, or excuse me, tech documentation falls into? So it's either images, which are nice illustrations, which are really uh, sharp looking, uh, high quality JPEGs, for example, or maybe it's animations where we see components moving, see components changing position, changing color, changing size. Uh, all of those things can happen in a composer animation. And then we even get into some interactive content, content that could be viewed in a web browser where it has uh, links and it has clickable content and interactive highlighting and, and doesn't need um, anything but a browser to be to be viewed or, or be interacted with. So again, for the purposes of this demonstration, these are the buckets we're really talking about. But um, again, I encourage if you have other ideas, you have things that you say, hey, this is a, an area where we would use Composer or a type of content that we would like to create, let us know uh, and, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. But these are the buckets we're really using for getting started with uh, SolidWorks Composer. So first we're gonna talk about images. Images I've always considered to be composers, low hanging fruit, the bread and butter of composer, easily exported, easily named, a lot of really great controls over how they're gonna be named with templates, cutaways, arrows, other annotations, bill materials easily created or even imported from SolidWorks. So if it's already created in SolidWorks, you can easily import that really, a lot, in a lot of respects, views that would be near impossible to create with any other tool. And I, I say this because I think if a company were to purchase Composer and get started with Composer, I think this is where you get your return on investment most quickly is, is you start creating images that go into service manuals, that go into technical documents really quickly and can be updated. And that's where the return on investment happens very quickly. So I, I, that's why I call it kind of the low hanging fruit of Composer content. And then once that's up and running, then you can really get into the, the more complex, the, the, um, you know, the animations, the interactive stuff and, and really show others what Composer can do. But um, again, I think you would really be impressed with uh, images as well. So why don't we take a look at that file we currently have open and making some images from it, making some content that we could use downstream. So let's just jump back to Composer. So, so far, reviewing what we've done, we did file open, we converted this assembly to an SMG file, and then we saved as the SMG into its own folder. I am in the habit of, as soon as I'm at that phase, as soon as I'm at that point, right away, I wanna come up to this upper left corner and hit this create view button. And create view basically will take what you have on screen, what you have on the graphic screen at the moment, and save it off in a captured view, which we'll see appear here in just a second. So I'm going to hit create view, and I see that it's taken whatever is on screen and captures it as a view. And then I'll even name that view default. And that gives you a home, or it gives you a, a, a default view to get back to if you change this assembly. And it's a good, uh, easy way to get back to a home or get back to a default view. So if I were to pick this cover, transform it, 
up into space. I accidentally grabbed the camera and moved the camera off to some arbitrary spot by accident, right? I've made some changes, whatever it is. I know that no matter what, I can click that default view and get right back to how it was the very first time I opened this file. And that's right out of the training class. We teach that in the training class as well, that it's beneficial to have that default view. And that's really what these views are, is they capture properties. They capture changes to whatever you have on screen at the moment. So let's make some changes. Let's make some, some different content. So anything about these composer actors, that's what composer calls them, anything can be changed. And by anything, I mean I click this actor. I just select this actor to begin with. And with that actor picked, so we'll, we'll pick this actor. And with that actor picked, the properties pane will fill out with everything Composer knows about that file. So let's zoom in here, and we'll just kind of take a look at what some of the things are. So, what, of course, what is the actor named? And this name comes directly from the, the CAD data, of course, of uh, when the, the file was created. What color is that actor? What opacity does the actor have? Um, does it have a bomb number? Maybe it's number one or maybe it's number 203. Doesn't matter. You can fill that in and have that component be whatever number you want. Does it have a texture? What's its outline style? Um, is there any additional user properties? That's a great section. I'll scroll down here a little bit just so we can see that. Does it have any additional user properties? Uh, like a description or a vendor name or a material. All of these things are things that we would probably apply or create in SolidWorks or in the CAD environment, maybe even with PDM. All of those properties come into Composer and they can be shown here. So the, the views, the screen, if you can think about it like this, the view will capture all of the properties about every actor on screen at that moment. So if I were to change a property, if I take this cover, this top piece we have changed right now, I take that and I change it to green. So it just has a, a green color. I don't think I got that. Do that again. There we go. So I take that and I give it a green color. I've changed a property. I've changed something about that actor. So if I now capture view, if I create view again, the only thing that really should be different between these two views is that top board so i double click between them and i see the only thing that is changing is the color of that top actor but it's not just colors again it's really any property that you change can be recorded and captured with these views that includes the camera as well so maybe our camera angle changes i'm just going to rotate by holding down my middle mouse button I'm holding down my middle mouse button just like you would do in SOLIDWORKS to rotate this assembly. And I'm going to right click this view, update view. So update is interesting because it takes whatever you have on screen and instead of making a new view, it just updates the one that you're picking. Update view. Now when I click on this one, I see the camera angle change and the actor goes back to gray and then sure enough, camera angle changes and he goes back to green. So these views will just capture whatever you change on screen and save them off as it looks like little pictures or little little uh, images but those are just thumbnails that just give you a representation of what that view looks like and the thumbnail can actually be misleading sometimes because you can actually limit the information you capture you know maybe i only want to capture information about you know one of the parts rather than all of them and i capture that uh, as well with one of the workshops the view will still look the same. So my, my only my only point there is don't don't let the thumbnails throw you off. They're they're uh, meant to be representations. What's more important and actually is more helpful than even the thumbnail image is giving them a name that makes sense to you. So in this case, maybe I would name this green board uh, rotated, right? Because that's that's what I did. I rotated a little bit and gave it a green board. And that's just an example. But the point is as we're making views and as we're making um, changes to this, we want to record that not only with views, but by naming those views with something that makes sense. Okay, so let's make some more views. I'm going to return to my default. And one of the things I really like about Composer, and this will be surprising at first, is that none of the mates, none of the 
constraints that you put on this assembly in SOLIDWORKS, none of those are actually here in Composer. So for example, I could click these four caps. I'm going to hold control, one, two, three, and four, and grab those four caps and do translate. And a uh, triad, a pivot, appears at the middle of the bounding box for those four components. It's kind of faint. Let's zoom in so we can see where it is. But you see that this really faint red bounding box around these parts, you can see it's kind of 3D there as well. That represents the center of mass or the center of, of space for those uh, components. So it's giving you kind of a representation of what that would look like. So with this picked, I can just grab this green handle and move those caps up into space. And we know that in SOLIDWORKS, that would probably be pretty difficult. I'd probably have to suppress the mates that are holding those uh, in place and then maybe pick them and, and do something similar like a move with triad. The point with Composer, and one of the things you want to get comfortable with right away with Composer, is it's not a CAD tool. It's not meant to uh, have everything be so precise and, and, and um, you know, engineered. It's really meant to be more of a creative authoring tool or, or a technical documentation tool, obviously. So in some respects, you get to let go of those, uh, those hard constraints with SOLIDWORKS and with CAD tools in general. You have a lot more freedom here to make content that just tells a good story and and just looks good rather than being something you're going to manufacture your parts to it's not a manufacturing drawing this is an assembly manual this is something that the end user needs to be able to look at a picture and and be able to understand as much as possible from that single picture so i've moved those four caps up into space and i can actually continue on to the propellers as well i'll just hold control again picking the propellers Right, just as easily move those up into space and uh, and drop them. And maybe I don't like my camera angle because I'm kind of seeing the assembly behind this propeller. So we could tweak it just a bit and just kind of see that in space. And I will capture view again. So you notice that this capture view is uh, very quickly becomes your best friend because it's it's how you save your work in Composer. I still need to save this file. So for example, I still need to come up and hit save and save the file occasionally, just like you would with SOLIDWORKS. But in Composer, your saved work is really controlled by these views here. OK, so just to review, I've got my default view. We've got our green board rotated view. And then we have our exploded propellers view. And that uh, should serve as a reminder that we got to name it something that makes sense. So we'll call this uh, explode-prop. Uh, so we've moved those props up into space with their caps as well. I want to put some explode lines on these caps and props just to show their, their path or show their movement. And this, there's a really easy automated tool for that. I could pick, um, I'll turn off translations here. I could pick this and manually draw a line. Composer has a thawing tools here, and one of those tools is to create uh, polylines. But the tool I want to use is create an associative path from neutral. So there's a lot of words there that, that are telling a story. And I have this cat pick. So when I hit, hit create associative path from neutral, it's creating a path that associates to wherever this component is to its neutral spot. And that neutral word is pretty important because neutral in composer means default. Neutral means on uh, where it last was when you updated from the CAD file, and that's really what neutral means. So as far as Composer knows, when this thing was last updated, the neutral spot was right above the motor for that cap. This is convenient because this line also happens to pass through our propeller as well. Maybe there's things I don't like about that line, and maybe I want to replicate that line for these other parts. I could have actually just picked them all at once. So let's just grab the other three, path, create associative path from neutral, and we've completed that with our uh, additional paths and additional lines there. So again, maybe there's some things about that I don't like. I could pick this path, and here's the properties for the path. This pane updates with whatever you have picked. So before I picked that board, and here's the properties for the board, well, the path is going to have very different properties, very different things to, to tell us about what that component is or what that actor is. 
So when I click on the path, this pane will update real time with whatever those properties are, even though that they're dramatically different from the properties of this uh, upper board here. If you pick identical actors, so I'm holding control and picking one, two, three, and four lines, it will show me common properties. What properties do those actors have in common that we can change at the same time? So, you know, for example, if I were to pick this line and the propeller, there's not a whole lot that they have in common. Uh, opacity and tooltip. Tooltip means when I hover over it, what does that tooltip say? So that's why when I, I pick two dissimilar actors, I don't get very, um, very much feedback in the properties pane. But if we pick identical actors, I'll pick again these four lines here. The pane filters down to what can you change at the same time? So there's a few things we can change and we might want to tweak about this. How about the type? You know, that dash, um, that style of a dash and then a dot and then a dash looks nice, but maybe we want something a little different, like just a, a series of dots. Maybe I like the series of dots and maybe I want to turn that down a little bit so those dots are just a, a bit smaller uh, in, in size. And there's also another really great option here called stay on top. And you notice this checkbox here. I'm going to zoom in so we can see what this looks like. Stay on top means that as the those lines pass over or through components, they kind of appear like they're on top of them. And I can see that, that even though we made them in 3D, they look like they're going right over top of that propeller, uh, which isn't very helpful. So with all four lines picked here, Let's turn off that checkbox for stay on top. Now they kind of trim in 3D real time as I rotate and move around. Regardless of what your angle is, they become 3D components and do not stay on top of other actors. So that's pretty cool. That looks pretty nice. I'll, I'll Maybe I'll position it uh, just like that and then I'll hit create view or maybe I want to just right click our explode view here, update view to capture that. So back to default, and then back to the exploded view uh, here with the props up in space. All right, so that looks cool. So maybe we have um, the views we need. And really, as a designer or as a technical publication um, person, you're thinking about the document that you have. And that document still has to be created in Word or Publisher or, again, name your external tool here. But what you're thinking about is what views do I need? What views do I need to create that we're going to use downstream? And I think you have to kind of know that going in. You have to know that when you're in Composer, what views you're going to need. So for me, as a graphic designer or, or the engineer or whoever the, the uh, Composer user is here, I'm thinking, OK, I need a default view. I need, I need this as a home. I need an exploded view that shows how to service uh, these propellers, how to remove the propellers from the drone. Maybe I need a cutaway view to show, you know, maybe the interior of how to hook up the battery, for example, right? So I always will use the default as a home or as a safe place to return to. And when I create a cutting plane in Composer, you can choose which parts cut away. So I know the battery connector is kind of on this back side. So maybe I want to just cut away some of the parts so we can clearly see how to how to cut away or how to again maybe hook up that battery and this is just an example right but if i pick these components i pre-select the components i want to cut i'm going to cut those two maybe these couple pieces of hardware here maybe we'll just get all these on this side and again i'm, I'm just kind of uh, free handing it here of whatever parts we want to cut away and maybe we'll cut away the top part of this board to show the the underside and then when we create a cutting plane, so I've got those parts pre-selected and I go to author and I'm on, on cutting plane here and I hit create cutting plane. Cutting plane will turn your cursor into this tool. And the easiest way to describe this tool is to say that it's looking for a face to go perpendicular to. So it's looking for a face to align the cutting plane with. So in SOLIDWORKS, we would call that normal two. It's looking for a face to kind of snap normal to, or again, in Composer, I'll say perpendicular. And maybe I'll use the side face of this board here. That's another thing I really like about Composer is you notice I don't have to zoom in super close to grab that face. It's very good at 
maybe call it, you know, on-demand filtering or live filtering as you move your cursor around. So when I click this side face, it has created a cutting plane that will now just cut away the components that I've included in that, you know, predefined list of parts we want to cut or, or um, you know, predefined group. And again, you can group that or, or do whatever you want with, uh, with those components. With the cutting plane picked, here's the cutting plane. I have a whole list of properties that we can change about that cutting plane. As we would expect, what color is it? How does it handle the cutting lines? You know, I'm seeing it's actually outlining the components as it cuts them. It's putting this new outlined face on those edges as it cuts through. Uh, do we want it to do that? And, and uh, what color should that be? How thick should that be? Should it keep the actor color as they're cut? Should, should they uh, cut in a different color? Should it, um, you know, uh, not color uh, the cut faces, maybe retain the color of the actors? Ha what should the hatching be? Hatch by actor means if I have a whole group of actors in the same area, it will give different hatching for the different actors in different directions. Again, kind of helping you delineate between multiple parts. So, you know, this is not a CAD tool, but even though it's not a CAD tool, we have a lot of complex controls over what those uh, cutting planes and what the section views look like. I like this a lot too. You probably don't want to see this plane. You don't want to see this plane. It's nice to have, I can just click anywhere on it to move it around. It's nice to have that when you're creating it. But afterwards, I can uncheck the box, uh, excuse me, I can turn down opacity so we just don't see it. Opacity is your indicator for how visible something is, how opaque is it. So I'm just turning that down so it's not there anymore. So I've cut away a lot of those parts. I can see the underlying boards now and some of the speed controllers, the battery connector, of course, and, and how the power hooks up. All that looks awesome. I'm going to create a new view and we'll call this, um, I don't know, it's, it's power cutaway. And the thumbnail is helpful. The thumbnail will help us remember what that is, but giving it a solid name or something that makes sense to you will definitely um, make it that much easier. Okay, so we have exploded view, we have a cutaway. You know, one of the things we mentioned before was creating arrows or creating annotations. So for example, if, if I'm uh, looking at the board directly down, I wanna make one of those arrows that show maybe the rotation angle of the propellers or, or how the propellers would spin. I can go up to author and find arrow and underneath arrow, we actually have circular arrow. Composer will pick up on edges. So as I'm hovering over different edges on this part, it's using those as reference or as location to drop this arrow. So you're not worried about the size initially. You're just trying to get the correct reference. So I know that I, I probably have a lot of circular edges here I could utilize. And a lot of them would share the same central axis uh, for this propeller. So maybe I'll just use one of these larger ones. Like I know that would probably be a good one. The second click defines height. Where should this actor sit? So if I rotate a little bit, maybe I want it to sit just on top of where that propeller would be in space. So I'll drop it there. And then the third click would let you place more of them if you wanted to continue on from there. Now, as you hover in, you have a lot of grab handles and it's actually kind of surprising initially how many grab handles you have on this actor. And this just lets you redefine things like what's its overall length, what's the overall uh, height even of just the head of the arrow. And to remind yourself what these are, if I click the arrow, I have the arrow picked, here's the properties for the arrow. That's a repeating theme. Everything that you click in space will show its properties on the left side. Everything can be changed here too. Like as you dial these up, you can actually see the actor change real time on screen. So if I change the radius, for example, I see that propeller uh, get larger or smaller on screen. And as of right now, I want to make sure that um, I'm kind of representing this correctly from, from a size perspective. So I want to align myself with the top of this actor so we can see uh, straight down, right? So if I go to um, we'll go up to render here, excuse me, on home. And home lets you change your camera angle. 
and I try and compare this to SolidWorks as well, that if you go to a line camera on face, it's a lot like SolidWorks where you have normal too. So I choose a line camera on face. It turns your cursor into that same tool we saw before with the cutting plane. Any one of these flat faces would work. I'll use this big flat face on the top of our board here and align my camera with that face. So one interesting thing right now is we do have perspective turned on. So perspective, if you've used it in SolidWorks, you know, can kind of throw your position off or your, uh, your perspective, right, of how you're viewing something. So I just turn perspective off down here on the lower corner. But um, it's the same thing, and you'll run into the same things you kind of run into with SolidWorks, that even though I'm looking directly down onto this assembly, it still looks kind of askew. So we'll turn off perspective. And perspective, by the way, is a view-specific property. So depending on the view you're in, you, you could have perspective turned on or off uh, depending on where you're working. And I think it's actually caused our, uh, our arrow to shift here. So we'll realign our arrow. Make sure our arrow is perfectly aligned there, and then we'll go align camera on face from the straight down. Okay. So maybe I want to change that radius or move that arrow just a bit, and we'll just grow that arrow just a bit uh, from the radius value there. Look at these other um, options though: the angle, how how far this um, uh, arrow goes around, any value such as this can be animated too so maybe you do a simple animation where you show this arrow uh, angle changing over time and showing the the rotational movement of that propeller and that's one of the things you start to pick up with with composer is things like that are very easy and very straightforward uh, forward whereas with solidworks or or other tools that weren't designed to do this um, it just is a little bit more painful right those things just take more time so, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not very artistic, so I'm not going to put too much of an artistic spin on this, I guess, but I'm just moving this around. Maybe I'll get my arrow positioned a little bit better there, and then we'll hit create view, and then I'll just call this view arrow. And of course, this is just, uh, just an example. But other annotations, other things you can do while we're here talking about 2D images, we still have to get into animations and interactive content. But in uh, author here, you know, we did an arrow. You also have images, Im uh, 2D images that you can just kind of lay in space. So if I pick a 2D image here and just drop it, and then I can pick this image and map it to whatever texture, whatever image I want. So as you move your assembly around, that stays 2D or that stays fixed on screen. Other things that are here um, in author, actual dimensions. I can put actual uh, dimensions on this file as well. Although it's not a CAD file, it does pull actual dimensional information from the CAD file. So maybe I'll just pick up on one of these circular edges here as an example and just kind of drop this in space. And as you might imagine, everything about this actor can be changed. What does that uh, call out look like? What color is it? How big is it? All those things can be changed about that actor. And I'm just kind of doing some some quick examples here as well. Uh, you can put more uh, lines, you can sketch your own polylines if something uh, moves in an interesting angle or an interesting way for disassembly. Uh, that's an option. You can do cutaways for multiple parts. You know, I'm going to update our arrow view here, but when we did this cutaway before, uh, we did one direction for a group of parts. You can actually do two cutaways and, and uh, cut multiple parts from different angles all at once. So. That's a lot, right? There's a lot there to, to kind of digest and unpack with Composer's capabilities. But the point is that this is a purpose-built tool for doing high-end, uh, high-quality images that can then be turned around and used in documents. So let's say we're happy with our first group of images here, ready to use these downstream, ready to use these in a publishing tool. There is a workshop. So I go to workshops and I go to high-res image workshop. Workshops will always open on the right side of the screen here, and, and workshops are pre-grouped sets of tools that help you quickly accomplish tasks in Composer. So this task is exporting high-resolution images. When I have this image active, it's going to default to just exporting that one. But I'm going to switch to this multiple tab and hit the checkbox for views, because we want Composer to export all of the views not just the one I'm working on or not just the one I have active, 
um, you know, out, out here on screen at the moment. And if you notice what it's doing is it's going to name those files with the same template. So file name underscore view name for every one of those files. So let's just do a test here. Got all views on, high resolution. We could even say use documents paper size. That's the, the size of the images. Remove the ground, use a, a white background here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you could also change the quality of that JPEG, how, how large and how precise the JPEG file itself is. And I'll even turn on anti-aliasing, which will clean up the images and make them even sharper. I'll hit save as, we're in that composer file from before, and I'm making a lot of files here, but we'll call this images and just save those images into that folder and then we'll hit save. And what I wanna do is jump out on my other screen here. We'll go to composer, go to images, and I'll pull these over just so everybody can see them here. And we'll zoom in just so we can see what those images look like. But these are the series of JPEGs that Composer was able to that quickly export. So, for example, what does our, our, uh, you know, our exploded view look like here? So this is the image it was able to export that quickly from Composer. And the, the thing you want to think about, the, the reoccurring theme is, okay, I've got this set of images. I've got this group of images now to work with. I can take those and insert them into Word documents, insert them into presentations, insert them into our website, into you know whatever uh, file share controls images for the website. And at some point, if the Composer file updates, all you have to do is go back to this workshop, re-export those views, and overwrite those views into the same folder. So let's pop into that same folder, images, overwrite these views with the same names and, and whatever is using them, whatever is using these images downstream is just automatically updated, whether it was a Word document or again, the, the website or some downstream program or some other program, um, whatever it is, it will pull in those updated image files. And that's really where we bring it all back and say composers images is the low hanging fruit. If you can get that file in, if you can quickly create images, quickly create cutaways and annotations and call outs and exploded views. And if it's not the SOLIDWORKS user, if the SOLIDWORKS user can keep designing parts, keep making content or keep making um, you know, new designs, this means that composer can get you that return on investment uh, pretty quickly. Okay, that was a long-winded uh, explanation of images, and that's because I think they're the most important because they really help you with these next two. So our next category, animations, although it might seem complicated, it's it's actually um, even simpler than creating images uh, in Composer. So it's fast, animations are easy to create, they're similar to movie editing software. So if you've used Camtasia, Windows Movie Maker, iMovie, or something like that, um, it's similar to that. It has kind of the same look and feel. Auto keys does most of the work for you. So we'll, we'll talk about that and show that here in a second. There's a built-in library of animations and new for Composer. Now we can export to MP4 files. Let's jump over to Composer and take a look at it. In our same file here, I want to make an animation maybe where, you know, we, we can really pick and choose here what we want to do, but where the, the prop cap uh, maybe unscrews and then comes off, and then maybe the, the propeller is able to just come off right behind it. So in Composer, if you're ready to do an animation, first thing you want to do is switch to animation mode. It's in this corner here. I click this uh, symbol right now that looks like two Polaroid pictures. And uh, by the way, this is a, an interesting reminder. If you do change something about your current on-screen view, and I go to change, I go to move, Composer will warn you and say, hey, that view arrow that you were just working on has changed. Do you want to update it with those changes or do you want to save it into a new view or do you just not want to save it? Do you just want to disregard it? So this is a nice reminder that if you are working on something and, and you forget to update your view or create a view, Composer will warn you of that before you go to move on to your next phase. So I'm going to hit don't save. We don't need any changes I made to that arrow view. And when you're in animations, uh, animation mode, you want to have your animation timeline visible at the bottom. So I'll go to home and I'll turn on uh, our animation timeline. 
and that animation timeline will appear. These components are remembering that I moved them right when, we're, when we open the file. So I'm going to pick everything here and do transform restore neutral. I like that button. That just means whatever I have picked, throw it back to its neutral position. Put it back to where it was last time this file was saved. So the animation will record, let's just say, two main things to get started. It will record whatever your camera angle is. So maybe this is our first camera angle. Uh, something zoomed out like this. So I'll hit record camera key and that's what this button does right here. And I want the camera then over two seconds to transition to this view here. So then I hit record camera key again. And it's just that easy. That composer, because of auto keys, because of the this interpolation, will do that translation for you, will do most of the work for you. So now that we zoom in, animations can zoom in, from here forward, I want the cap to uh, unscrew and then pop off um, and into space, right? So I'll pick the cap. I pick the cap itself. I see the properties for the cap, although we don't really need them at the moment. I can see that now. Uh, it's also picked on screen. We need to record that at two seconds, the cap should be where it currently is. So I, with the cap picked, I hit this button to set location and it will record and kind of stamp in time okay at two seconds that cap needs to be there and then at let's just bump out to four seconds I'm moving my blue time bar here at four seconds that cap should rotate should be in a rotated position so i go up to rotate i can pick any axis i want to rotate this component but you might guess that it's going to be this one, right? It will default to axes that make sense depending on how this model was oriented in space when it was created. But I can see that this one makes the most sense for what I'm trying to accomplish. So if I click this axis, it lets you click a value. I can certainly click, hey, I need this to rotate to 180, but then you notice it starts counting backwards. It starts counting down. So instead of clicking, I can actually come over here and just key in a value. And I'll key in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I want this to rotate, I don't know what this value is right in real life, but we'll just say 900 degrees totally. So over that two second period, we'll, we'll unclick this. That component rotates that total of 900 degrees. It does it in small increments. You can see all these little keys that were automatically created for you. But over that two second period of time, that cap will now rotate that 900 degrees. Okay, that looks pretty good. And then maybe I'm not doing this as as simple uh, as possible. At four seconds to six seconds, I want the cap to kind of appear to move up into space. And I'll, I'll pick uh, that component. I'm here at four seconds. I'm again, gonna record its uh, initial location and then I move it out into space to six seconds. We're still in rotate mode so I'll switch to translate mode and in translate we'll just drag that component up. And before I let go of this, before I drop that actor and I, I let go, take note of that blue bar on the time timeline. Take note of where that is right now because as soon as I let go of this actor, I'll let go of it right now, a new key appears there automatically. So auto keys is recording that change. It's recording that uh, move from one view to the other, from, from position A to position B. And that's where I'm, I'm saying really Composer does most of the work for you. So let's kind of review our animation and see where we're at right now. I'm gonna jump back to the beginning. Our camera angle zooms in, that component spins for 900 degrees and then goes off up into space. That's creating an animation like that from the most simplistic standpoint. And, and you could even go on then, right, to say, okay, now that we're at six seconds, the propeller doesn't need to unscrew. It just is press fit by this cap so that that propeller um, over a one second period of time, I recorded its initial, and then over a one second period of time, the propeller could come up off of its base. So it really is very simple to step forward in creating an animation in Composer because you follow that same repeated workflow. You set the initial, you move the time bar, you physically change the actor, and then Composer will see that change. Composer will see that um, property change over time and record it for you. 
if you've ever done animations in SolidWorks, um, I think you could attest to it. It wouldn't be that simple. And, and not to knock SolidWorks, it, it approaches animations, um, depending on what solver you're using, more more from a you know a kinematic approach or or, or an engineering approach. This is much more freeform and really lets you do uh, whatever you want. Okay, so that is uh, an easy look at making those animations. I can also save that out to an MP4 or an AVI with the workshop video workshop, and I'll hit save video as just so you can see what the options are here. MP4 is newer, believe it or not. In, in older versions of Composer, we only had AVI. And it's great to see now we have MP4, which is a much more usable. Um, now you can get more advanced than that. So if if I wanted to continue on and animate additional actors, and I did that in, in a very manual approach, in a, a very manual method, I mentioned we have this built-in animation library. And you have this animation library here, which once I click it, it opens as a workshop. And it will let you take actors and almost apply predefined groups of movement to them. So with this actor picked, I want to do something similar. I'm going to turn off that transform mode here. With that actor picked, I want to do something similar in this template. So here's a template. I want to make a motion animation of unscrewing. And you notice what these other options are here. But unscrew means if I if I choose this. It says it's going to flash, meaning call your attention to that part. You could turn that off if you don't want that to, to happen. It's going to rotate that part and then also begin translating that part. And it's doing it over whatever time period you want. So by default, here's kind of a, a look at what it's going to do. It's going to flash and then begin to rotate and translate at the same time eventually the rotating stops eventually you don't have any more rotation to do and it just continues on uh, translating everything we did a moment ago was kind of the manual method i'm just showing you this to say that there's there's faster ways there's more advanced ways uh, to do this so for rotation i want it to rotate about um, you know you can pick your axis here you can pick uh, what would make most sense for you so i'm going to pick maybe one of these inside axes, if I can get it to line up in that hole there, that will work. And if we're rotating about that axis, I could say not not just one time, I want it to rotate uh, four times maybe. And then for translation, you can do something similar. I want it to translate uh, along that same axis. I could probably even use this face as a vector, but I'm holding Alt, getting it to pick up on the middle of that part, using that as my vector. And the direction it's using, again, it's going to go by a one, but we could uh, we could bump this up or down or whatever this change uh, is. And with this actor picked, I'm going to hit create. So now I should see something similar, and, and maybe now we'll also update the camera to copy this camera key to here. And over this period of time, I want it to transition from this camera over to this camera let's see man, that, that four value might have been a little aggressive let's see that looks like it might be that's fine we'll check it out and then we'll save this off and see what this does and we'll hit play so it flashes it spins and then as it's spinning it rotates and uh, it translates rather so we should see our camera angle kind of snap to that new position and then that component flashes translates and moves that's just an example but two two different ways to approach the same thing and it will show you in the timeline here's the traditional method you can kind of see the traditional keys that i created and then the workshop makes more modern kind of easier to understand keys it even puts a big label on what that whole period of time is doing so definitely a little bit more user friendly and again newer this is newer in the last few versions of composer Okay, so as mentioned, animations were actually easier, I think, and there's less to them than uh, than doing uh, views, at least at first. I mean, you can get really crazy with animations. And, and in the training class, we actually teach that and show some examples that have thousands of keys and, and tons of different movement interaction between components. And again, by default, by default with Composer, there's no mates. So one question 
that commonly comes up is, hey, if I want to rotate a part, it, it, you know, how it would normally mate, how am I going to do that if none of those mates are here? So let's just do a really silly example. If I'm going to pick this board and I want to rotate that board around this pin, I know that's a silly example, but it'll work. And if I do transform rotate, it defaults to that board's center of mass. That's where rotate will default to. There's a secondary mode here called detect curves. Detect curves lets you take the command you're currently in and use curve detection. I'm picking up on different curves on this fastener here. There's probably a few different ones we could use, but I'll, I'll use maybe one of these outside ones. If I can get it to pick one of those. Very sensitive. So if I pick that edge there, then it pivots and rotates around that edge. So when someone uh, is concerned that the mates are not here in Composer, this is the first thing I'll show or the first thing I'll reference is that you really don't need them because with the combination of, uh, you know, the combination of detect curves and all of those other functions, you really don't need to have all that mate information and constraint information here in Composer and you can just kind of really quickly uh, do whatever you want. All right, so let's finish up here with interactive content. We've covered images we've covered animations this is the real fun one and this is the one that you know when you really get downstream with composer and you get into exporting you get into looking at advanced areas where you can export composer files too this is the kind of stuff you can get into so website touchscreen friendly content uh no need to be a web designer of course 2d and 3d capable i again consider this to be phase two of composer when, when you get more skilled and, and have more time with Composer. And one area where I try to really talk about is, is uh, configure price quote um, systems or you know uh, systems on websites where you wanna click something, configure it and get a quote for what that group of parts would be in that configuration. SolidWorks Cell is another option for that. And I actually think it's, it's a better fit option in a lot of cases than Composer would be. And I'm just mentioning to say that if, if that's what you're trying to get to with Composer, SolidWorks Cell might actually be another really great option for that, uh, just, just, just kind of as a side note. But let's take a look at some of the things we can do with Composer um, you know, in, in terms of that, that interactive content bucket. So the first one, 2D interactive content is really straightforward. Let's go to our elect, um, explode propeller view. Maybe I'll add a simple build material. Let's get rid of this animation timeline on the bottom. Maybe we'll add a really simple build material underneath here, just so we have something to kind of click through and, and kind of reference. And underneath here, I have a workshop, a build material workshop. I'm gonna generate bomb. I'm going fast through this. This is just an example, something we would teach in the class, but I'll pick uh, for any geometry that's currently visible, let's generate bomb IDs. And, and it numbers those parts and it finds 47 unique items. We'll show the bomb table below. I pick the table so I can actually just change its position. And I'm just doing this fast just so we can get this example up on screen here. And I'll just kind of position the bomb just below our assembly. And the bomb really doesn't need to be that quite that big shrink that down a little bit. I like how the bomb in Composer 2 will regroup and resort itself depending on how uh, you have it positioned. Just kind of some nice things that again you, you don't get in SolidWorks. Like another thing is uh, if I pick the bomb here I can change the odd and even row color. I really like that so maybe the odd row color. Let's make this as ugly as possible. Green and purple <laughs> for odd and even. That's gonna make all the graphic artists out there cringe probably, but hey, that's okay. We'll save this off as a view, create that view. I'm getting getting loopy being locked up at home here for two months. We're starting to do some crazy things. And that view is now created and saved uh, in our, our views. So in terms of interactive content or content that be, uh, we would consider maybe 2D, there's a tech illustration workshop the tech illustration workshop, I'm just gonna hit save as and publish this out. That images folder will work. It's gonna save it as an SVG file. And I'll show you where that file ends up here in just a second. You can kind of see it's counting through and making that uh, view, making that SVG file a scalable vector graphics file. And if we take a look at this images folder, 
we'll let this uh, finish here. What it's actually doing here is it's making hotspot fields for every one of these lines. So for every one of those lines, it creates a hotspot or a field that if you hover over that line, it highlights the component on screen. So that just completed over here. Here's that hotspot. We will open that with um, Internet Explorer. We'll allow block content. That purple looks awesome. And as I hover over those components, maybe we can zoom in here just a little bit. Scalable vector graphics file. So as you zoom in, it still stays nice and sharp. And as you hover over those files, I'm interacting with those. I'm, I'm seeing that if I pick the camera up here, it highlights it on screen and vice versa. If I, if I pick the camera in the list, it highlights it in the assembly. So this is really simple. And this is just a simple, small file that can be viewed in, in, uh, in most browsers. You have to allow that block content for it to be viewable, but this is 400 kilobytes. So it's a pretty small file that you could easily uh, publish and use, and that's just one view, and, and you can really build from there with Composer. There's a lot more you can do with that hot spotting, but that's just one example. That is just one simple 2D SVG uh, scalable vector graphics file that we can create with Composer. You can also publish 3D files. So if I do file publish HTML, still in that images folder let's make a new folder in there called html and i'll drop all of this html content in there and the html output we'll use is just a simple view here it does this pretty quickly and you'll see what we what we end up with here in just a moment but here's that html folder we just made and everything in there was created that quickly so the the actual files, resources, the ActiveX control, and then of course the actual HTML file. And let's open that with Internet Explorer as well. And we'll allow that block content again, and we'll agree to the active control license agreement. So what you've done here is embedded a 3D file into a browser. So I've, I've kind of transitioned from, we were on a 2D file, an SVG file, now we're in a 3D file where I can interact and get a little bit more information about these components. The catch here is if you really want to dig into this and, for example, click this part and get its properties, get its name, get some of those advanced things we talked about before, you need to purchase an additional Composer Player Pro license. So that's where, before I mentioned, if you're getting to the point where you're trying to get like CPQ information and and configuring information out of these parts, we might have a better solution for you than Composer. But if not, if you're just trying to share really nice HTML files that can actually serve as 3D files where you can view the file and roll it around, that is a really nice option to have in terms of interactive content. So those are two examples or just two samples of what we would consider to be interactive content. And um, you know, I, again, I, I think I'm kind of trying to highlight here that those things are are almost products of taking the time to make the views. If you've made the views and spent the time really making sharp, usable views in, in a decent order that have correct names, you can see that animations and especially interactive content can benefit from, from spending the time on the views. So uh, very, very cool, definitely a downstream approach. Um, I have some examples here too. Like again, this is where in tech support, if I see a customer calls in, they show me some really high-end examples. It's really impressive because in a lot of times, it's it's even um, might might be something I didn't know, or might I might be able to pick up a, a thing or two. So for example, here's an SVG, and this is a live file, so I'm not showing anything proprietary here. This is on my tech's website. This customer was able to chain together some different views, <coughs> excuse me, for this assembly. So for example, if I want to see a close up of the enclosure here, pick the chamber view. And if I want to dig even deeper into the strong arm overview, let's dig into that. Okay, now I'm getting some more information about this component. I can dig even deeper into that component and get a build material with callouts. This is simple 2D data that can be published very quickly. And notice there's other links here. Remember before we did an image 2D, a, a 2D image that kind of stays in the corner, that can be treated as a link. 
anything in Composer can be created to have a link embedded in it. So maybe this is a link that jumps back to MyTech's website, for example. That's just one example. There was another really cool one here too with more in-depth wiring. This was like a wiring diagram done in Composer. And what I like about this is that when you hover over the wires, you get that fly out that gives you the wire ID. So just giving this to a team member, maybe viewing this on, on the shop floor or something, this makes it really easy to kind of step through and see what's going on. You have back and forward buttons and home buttons where you can kind of quickly, uh, quickly navigate this. The other thing to remember too is everything you make in Composer. So let's jump back to Composer. Everything you make in Composer, so I'll hit File, Save, and I'll update the view we're working on, and we'll save this file. And then we'll close this file, and I'm going to open up Composer Player. Everything in Composer can be viewed in Composer Player, and I'm going to pull this over here. This is a free player. It is on SolidWorks pub public website. You don't even have to sign in to download it. This can download, or excuse me, this can open all of these files we've been working on. So Here's the composer uh, file we just created. I'll hit open. The, the very best setup, the very best you can do is if you're making composer files, spending all that work to put all the data in the file itself, install composer player on team members' machines, on the, the assembly team's machines, on, on touch screens, on screens at a trade show, whatever it might be, and the player can take full advantage of that SVG file. You can even go into a full screen mode where you don't have buttons. Uh, that's jumping up on my other screen. You don't have buttons. You don't have any of the additional commands. You don't have your Windows start bar. You can just have a really clean interface where all they can do is click the reviews or press buttons if you've pre-created your buttons uh, on screen. Uh, that's really, again, when I get that question in tech support, what's the best way to share Composer data? The very best way is to encourage team members, encourage people to use the Composer player. You can actually test that in Composer too. So if we jump back to Composer itself, we'll open up that file. There is a button down here called Design Mode. And we'll, we'll finish up with this. But as you're creating all of this content, if I'm on View 6, and we turn off design mode. Design mode lets you kind of replicate how would a user interact with this? Um, how would a user interact with this on the floor? So if if we did have an author image 2D here, and then that image, whatever it is, map it to whatever you want, your company logo, whatever image you want, but that image should have an event. So when it's clicked on, I know I'm going kind of fast here, but just kind of wrapping up. And that image, it should go to HTTP www.cati.com. So as a user, how do, I want to know how my users are going to interact with that on the floor when they when they see that image. And we'll save that off as a new view. So as I'm hovering my mouse over it, it turns into a cursor. And I click it, and it pulls up cati.com test things, you can test your loops and test your workflows and make sure all of that uh, lines up correctly. Okay, so that was just a couple really cool examples of doing interactive content. Let's wrap up with a couple final thoughts here. So all of this really hinges on the ability to quickly update Composer files very easily. And I, I won't dig too deep into this because we cover this in depth in the training class, but I wanna show you where the two functions are and, and how you would access them. The easiest way, or, or I'll say the, the most direct way, if engineering notifies you, we have changed this assembly, the propellers are a different size, the, the, the board has some new holes in it, we've added some parts, you do File, Update, Composer Document, and it's asking to browse to the original CAD assembly, the original assembly, and it will open and check that for changes, subsequently update your composer file with those changes. If you get a notification that only one part has changed, if I get a, a notif, hey, we only modified one part, I can click a single part here and go to geometry update and then just replace that part with the updated version instead of updating the entire file. Updating the entire file is great, but it's a pretty extensive process and 
maybe there's changes you don't want to update. Maybe you're trying to be selective about the things that you are updating. If it updates and you don't like how it went, you can always just close the file without saving it and, and try again. So updating is interesting, and, and this is the approach. This is how updating works. SolidWorks Composer creates identifiers called NetGUI IDs based on the names of the parts, the subassemblies, and the body. So when you import a file into Composer, it actually kind of numbers them. We'll just call them numbers on the way in. It gives them all numbers. The NetGUI ID, the number, must match for Composer to consider that part has changed. So when you update, it takes that number. It, the part used to be named block 001. It has to still be named block 001 for the update to go correctly, for the update to work properly. New numbers new net GUI ids will get created as new parts they'll get added to composer to the smg as a new part removed parts removed net GUI ids will actually be deleted it will reach into the composer smg and pull them out and delete them because it's considering that they've been removed from the solidworks file the final thought there is use the same settings as when the file was created when i make this file when I create and we did one from scratch here I want to use those same settings consistently moving forward those controls when I did file open these controls are very important this one specifically merge file into one actor per part as you have multi-body solids uh, assemblies with multiple parts in them that kind of stuff uh, the numbers will change depending upon this option. So that's usually where I see an update issue is if they tried to first create the file with this off and then update with this on, for example, all the numbers will change. Everything will kind of get misaligned at that point and it won't work. So the other, other things to consider here, we talked about before, import free faces uh, is a big one if you want construction faces to come in. Actually, in this drop down here, I can do import SolidWorks with surfaces and it will check that box for you. So those are important, but just the end of the end of the road there, uh, the end, end result is use the same settings as when the file was created. And finally, turn on debug if you want to learn more. This isn't required, but in Composer, if I go to file preferences and I think it's in advanced settings. Then this very last option is show debug properties in properties pane. This is off by default. In fact, it's off for me here because this is a new install, but I'm going to apply it and turn it on. So now when I pick a part, and we kind of just scroll down, you get some additional info that we didn't have before. So, you know, the, the net GUI ID, the uh, actual part that it was referencing if it can find it. So you get some additional information. So when you're not getting parts that line up correctly, that's one thing you can do. Kind of just click through your parts and see, oh, okay, I see what it's doing. It's It was looking to a location that's no longer there, or we've renamed all the parts accidentally, something like that. So debug information can help tell a little bit more about what's going on. This is our final list here. These are just some tips and tricks for Composer. This is a good one to maybe take a screenshot of or, or kind of just keep in your back pocket. The great bulk of issues that I see in tech support with Composer are actually related to SolidWorks. So if you have SolidWorks open, large assembly mode, large design review, automatically load components in lightweight, all of those options actually cause problems with Composer. So here's SolidWorks. I'm just gonna pull up the options menu here. And in options, assemblies, large assembly mode. When do we kick on large assembly mode? If you're someone who's importing Composer, large Composer files a lot, you want to turn this off or at least be aware of where this threshold is. Long story short, if parts get into that large assembly mode or large design review, if SolidWorks accidentally opens them in one of those modes, Composer will not be able to properly import everything it needs from the file. Don't install the converter slash importer and SolidWorks. We talked about that before, and it's really hard to do these days, but try to avoid installing both. We can help you in tech support if that does happen. Use the latest version of Composer. There's, uh, there's no way of changing the CAD file. So even if your engineers are on 2018 or 2019, 
you can have composer be on 2020 that's fine and and definitely recommended and uh you know again something we can help you with uh if if you wanted to double check your import settings i think we talked about that quite a bit giving props to jennifer at solidworks she has helped me quite a bit over the years with composer and a lot of these things came directly from her especially this one xvid codec for avi export not as uh big now because now we have mp4s as we showed before but it, when we used to have only avis um there's this free codec if you just google this xvid codec it's just an additional converter for uh, compressing avi files and it makes it a lot easier it's a little bit less relevant now because we can do SP, uh, mp4s but still still nice use assembly selection mode with a uh, assembly group so if i'm in composer and you know, I'll, I'll just use an example here. If I pick, I'll expand this assembly. If I pick that assembly, this um, 1200 upper deck and camera, it actually picks everything in that assembly. It doesn't pick the assembly, it picks everything in the assembly. If I kick on assembly selection mode, then pick on the assembly, then it will pick just that part. That has a lot of benefits in Composer, but even just knowing that command, this first button, it's funny, it's assembly selection mode and they use a part symbol. I don't know why, but keep that in mind. That's that's definitely uh, definitely very, very useful. And finally, check in video graphics settings and, and use the, the DS recommended uh, settings for those. So if you go into your NVIDIA control panel, maybe I can get that up on my other screen here. There's a predefined list of settings that work with Dasso products, and that's very impactful, specifically for Composer, for performance reasons, for stability reasons, all that kind of stuff. So if I were to set this <coughs> base profile here, Dasso Systems CATIA compatible, that will really help you, and I apply that, that will really help you with uh, Composer uh, issues, Composer stability, that kind of stuff. All right, I know I'm uh, running right up against the deadline here. Let's review the agenda. What is technical documentation with or without Composer? How do we import files into Composer? We imported one directly as a SOLIDWORKS assembly. We know we also could have exported it from SOLIDWORKS. How do we create technical documentation, images to use in downstream products, animations, some really cool interactive content. We went through some samples of each of those. We talked about how to update those files if anything were to change, and that's definitely something we can help you with in tech support if that's not going as expected. And then a few general composer tips and tricks that I've kind of picked up along the way. And again, I'm always uh, always open to new ideas and, and new things with composer if you come across something new in industry. So this is my contact information. If you have any follow-up uh, information or follow-up questions, 